as Paul trying to derail me, hasn't worked, hasn't worked. <laughs> no, it's good, yeah, no, it's all good. So there's no external um, investment. <laughs> On YouTube, typically, it will play the music video that's attached to, to, to that artist. We've got a, a cloud dashboard that allows you to up, upload content from anywhere. Hello. So, uh, good evening, guys. Uh, my name is Ashley. I want to, want to start by thanking Paul for inviting me. I run a company called Now Marketing. Um, we are founded in 2010. And uh, Now Marketing technically is the equivalent of what BT Openreach is to telecoms. Uh, we are to the marketing industry. So we, we have a lot of uh, white label partners that uh, take the Now Marketing brand away. Uh, probably why you haven't heard of us. Um, and they sell to hospitality, nightclubs, bowling, uh, uh, and things like that. Company's been running for 13 years now. We're completely bootstrapped, so there's no external um, investment in now marketing. Uh, it's literally grassroots. I was a director in the previous business and uh, decided that, that uh, 2010 was the time to, to, to start now marketing. So obviously with the um, the narrative of tonight is all about cloud, so we want Linode, but because Akamai bought Linode, I can say Akamai and it sounds cooler. Um, there's a little bit of uh, hardware that we've got, which is a little bit of get out of jail free, a little bit if virtualization goes wobbly. We do have some hardware, a one year of space, we have a nuclear, nuclear attack and we can still recover from it. Um, so the the, the main core infrastructure is, is built out of uh, virtual private servers, uh, S3 compatible storage, so technically all of the APIs that work with uh, uh, AWS services work with uh, the, the drop-in replacements, i.e. Linode, um, and we buy our IP transit, uh, and we've got the small amount of um, uh, co-location with uh, Cloud Coco, which has changed its, uh, changed its name more, more times than I've had uh, hot dinners. Uh, so obviously people tend to ask, you know, what's your stack? Uh, so we are uh, technically a, a, a LAMP stack. Uh, so CentOS, I'm glad you mentioned CentOS actually, because I, I think CentOS 7 is end of life June 2024. Yep. So obviously Apache, like one of the most popular, popular web servers in the world. Uh, MariaDB, which I, I don't know if many of you are familiar, but the actual founder uh, or the founding developer of MySQL decided to branch off of of MariaDB because he didn't really like uh, what, what happened commercially. I appreciate this is on YouTube, so I'm not going to say anything too bad, but MariaDB is technically what MySQL used to be and the community is fully behind it. And then finally, uh, PHP 8. Um, I know there's lots of people that are doing all these different types of uh, coding. Obviously, uh, as mentioned earlier, we've, we've got lambdas, so like code as a service in, in the cloud. Genuinely, I've learned one language and I've learned it well. Uh, my team all have coding conventions with us, so we all kind of write the same way. And genuinely, genuinely, hand on heart, um, I, I had a situation where I couldn't work out whether it's Mark, Jez, Jim, or, or me that have written the code because the coding convention was so tight. So one for me there. Um, so uh, the areas I'm going to talk about, it was going to be three sections. I waffle, which you've probably already spotted. I'm going to do two areas tonight. Uh, one is uh, acoustic fingerprinting in the cloud. Uh, everybody's heard of Shazam. Obviously, I think they're first to market like 98, 99. I think it originally was over like GSM. You, you, would, you would dial a five digit number, hold your phone up. 10 seconds later, long behold, a text message comes through. And you're charged something like 900 quid on your phone bill for, for, for it. <laughs> We've done the same thing for uh, small scale radio. Um, we've uh, licensed data through YouTube content ID, uh, Spotify and Deezer. Apple Music was part of it, then they bailed out just like Apple do. But the, uh, the bottom line with this is uh, there's several radio stations in Brighton. One of the founders is here with us this evening, Daniel Nathan. So you've got Platform B, uh, and you've got Slack City, and you've got Regency Radio. Jay's watching online. Um, so long story short, what we've done is we've taken the stream from all of these radio stations, we've transcoded it, and then we've, we've taken a sample every 10 seconds and we've compared it against Spotify's database, Deezer's database, and YouTube's content ID database. And this rebuilds 
all of the now playing information, what was previously paid uh, and so on, and some, which I'll get to. So technically the question is why? Why would you need to do that? We've got play out systems that are to the millisecond accurate. Uh, you've got you know, a whole array of uh, metadata and telemetric data that, that's coming into the uh, audio chain. And these DJs mix on their software like Serato. Some of them are even on vinyl. And technically, all of these outputs, you've got DAB, you've got the now playing on the website, uh, a player on, on your computer. Normally, the now playing is coming up in, 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 the, in the title bar. With this detection of metadata, uh, we, we get back a, a quite a lot of rich data like you expect on any commercial radio station, last played or you've heard your favourite song but you can't remember the name and you go to the whatever, whatever website to see it. It's exactly the same on Platform B's website. But we're saying, right, this is the artist, this is the title, and then we're able to constru construct a, a sentence from the data. So we're saying, from the album Devotion, released in January 2021 on, I can't pronounce the record label. And on top of that, because we've got Spotify data, and we've got Deezer data, and we've got YouTube content ID, we're able to put buttons. So technically, you click the button on Recently Played, and it will open out. So technically, if you've got your Spotify playlist, you're able to add it to, to, to your favourites, if that's the, the tune that you're taking interest in. Same for Deezer, and on YouTube, typically, it will play the music video that's attached to, to, to that artist and, and song. In terms of the data that's coming back from Spotify, Deezer, uh, and YouTube content ID uh, is, is literally, obviously I appreciate the people at the back, I'll, I'll read it out. We, we've got the, the track, the title, the album, we've got the label, so technically it could be Universal, it could be BMG. You've got the release date, you've got the track duration, which is really, really handy when we're getting this data in, but technically, even though we're sampling every 10 seconds, if a DJ is talking over the first 30 seconds, or somebody's doing a mix and it's a bit of a mishmash, and we can't get that, that, that detection, technically we might get that sample at 35 seconds. So having the track duration and the sample offset metadata, we're still able to correctly show uh, on the now playing exactly when that song actually started, regardless. It's almost like time shifting it, if that makes sense. Uh, we get the content ID uh, from the content ID. So that could be the YouTube ID, which is the funny letters and underscores that you get. Uh, Spotify, I think, is just... Um, uh, numerical and, and these are I think it's numerical. Uh, from that we're able to get album art so technically on the website which if I go back a couple of pages all of this album art we're, we're, we're pushing based on getting those getting those IDs um, uh, fr from from either Spotify, Deezer or YouTube and we tend to have a look and have a vote in the office you know who's got the best art and then so too, we've got th in some cases th three different types of art coming back we're then able to create direct URLs to the content, which I was dem demoing earlier on the recently played. That's how we have a click through to the YouTube website and so on. We've got the uh, ICR code, which I don't know if anybody here can remind me what that is. And we've got the UPC code as well. So technically, what, what the ISBN is to books, we're getting those codes back for, um, for the music. So uh, onto digital signage, uh, it, obviously at the start I explained I'm, I'm from a company called Now Marketing. We've got four like my ma main primary services that, that we either sell directly to customers or we uh, sell via channel partners. Uh, so one's email, the other one's SMS in terms of text messaging. The other one is public Wi-Fi. Uh, so you know when you walk into a venue and you've got this social captive portal that allows you to OAuth into Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Microsoft, Gmail, what have you. Uh, uh, the most recent product that we launched, uh, which is uh, completely hosted on the cloud, is our digital signage product. Um, so we, we work with uh, national companies, local authority, uh, one-man businesses, uh, anybody that, 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 that needs it. Um, technically, we've got one of these boxes, which I'll, I'll pass around uh, so people can have a look. Um, so these media players are, we call it the cloud media player. Um, it's got a VPN client on it. It connects via 2.4 gig or 5 gig Wi-Fi or, or Ethernet. Obviously, on installations, we try and go down the Ethernet route, but that's not always practical in terms of cable runs. The screens that we tend to install that are externally facing 
uh, are measured, so the output brightness is measured in nits or candela, it's exactly the same measurement, two different names. The TV in your living room, or this TV behind me here, is measured around about 400 nit in brightness. This screen here on the high street, which does have an ambient light sensor on it, uh, so technically if they've got direct sunlight shining in through the window, it will turn up the backlight brightness. And obviously if it's at night, obviously we don't want to give somebody a sun, suntan on the other side of the road, so it turns its brightness down. But, but typically these screens that we install are about 4,000 nit, so 10 times brighter uh, than the screen that, that, that's right beside me here. We work with local authority, we work with nationals, uh, we work with anyone that will take us, quite frankly. Um, so you've got these high brightness screens in the window. This one here for Brighton Centre on the south coast um, uh, uh, is actually a 75 inch screen. It's one of the largest that, that, that we do. We also do totems. The benefit of the totems is they're, they're on wheels. They can be pushed around. And in this case at Brighton Centre, I think they've got 12 of these units. Um, they're really good for signposting, really good for um, you know, directing uh, footfall and what have you and obviously because these media players that are going around the room at the moment are um, you know stand alone technically every screen can show independent content of the other which it, with the old wired systems you'd normally have like four channels uh, and it'd be one of those four channels the screens can show technically you could actually signpost arrows around a venue or what have you because of the, the unique content on a per screen basis in terms of the the setup for now marketing We've got 28 engineers, um, some like directly and some through partner channel, uh, but th these guys uh, c can install te technically anywhere I in the UK. In terms of the cloud dashboard, and obviously coming back to the, the, the subject of, uh, of uh, tonight's presentation, we've got a, a cloud dashboard that allows you to up upload content from anywhere and send it to any screen. So technically, uh, Obviously, people at local authority like to say, can I do it from my sofa at home? And we go, yes, you can. And that tends to end up with a contract, which is good. Um, we've built loads of tools inside the platform that allow people to obviously scroll through the content that they've uploaded, drag it to the other side, which technically builds like a, a playlist. Uh, there's loads of drop downs in terms of, we like to call it PowerPoint on steroids. So the transitions that we do between slides and video actually look quite good. Um, some of you guys might be familiar with companies like uh, ScreenCloud and Screenly and what have you. That's technically what we are as, as the cloud service. Um, but there's a few things that we've seen those companies not be able to achieve. So, for instance, I've got a Michael McIntyre video loop that's been provided by the promoter. And then we've got uh, a flat JPEG image. The other systems don't seem to be able to mix between the two. Either you're doing video or you're doing image. Um, Obviously, because all of the cloud technology that allows us to process this is proprietary, we, we've managed to kind of cross a line that we, we don't believe many of us have in this space. So the rendering side of it, there's quite a bit of a backstory uh, on, on all of this. Um, so technically, I, I don't know if anybody in the room is familiar with FFmpeg. Uh, for those who are not, uh, FFmpeg is the Swiss Army knife of video and, and audio. Um, we use it on the back end of our platform. So technically, everything that is produced here and glued together, we, through a rendering process, produce a video that then produces the final video. Originally, on the first version of the platform, we had an issue that we were giving people like a, a near fit view and then we're having things like fonts not quite being perfect or back shadows not being quite perfect and what have you. So technically the video that plays in this player before we, we then deploy to screens is actually the video that's sent to the screen. Um, so all of this rendering takes place, uh, takes place in the cloud and uh, the majority of this happens uh, on Linode that, Lino that, that has now been uh, acquired by Akamai. So at the point that you're happy with the video and you previewed it, you start ticking screens, which obviously is off the bottom. Obviously you can have multiple screens in multiple locations. We've got a scheduling system built in. So technically what we've learned from customer feedback is people tend to have like marketing Monday uh, and they want to do all of their work all in one go. Uh, and our system al allows them to do that. Yet again, just focusing on the power of the cloud. The bottom line is, is everything 
that I've showed you today is being hosted for less than 500 quid a month. Um, we've got 24 server instances all doing lots of different things like web front end, database back end, uh, VPNs, um, storage. We, we're using S3 storage for, for customer content, currently running at about 30 terabytes. And just to kind of give you an idea, 250 gig cost us about $5. It's nothing. In terms of IP transit monthly, we're doing about 44 terabyte, which, which is quite a huge amount in comparison to 10 years ago, that would have cost you a fortune. The, the co-location side of it really is our disaster recovery. If, if, if Akamai goes bust or something goes seriously wrong with virtualization, we've still got a colo to fall back on. And even if we can't be back up and running yeah, that hour, at least we know we've got all of our customers' data, which technically is the end of the business if we, if we don't have that. And I'm sure you agree with that. Um, so look, uh, thank you for listening, guys. My name's Ashley Hunt. Obviously, please take a photo if you wish in terms of uh, contact details. Obviously, happy to ask any, uh, answer any questions now if, uh, if anybody's got any. <laughs>
in terms of Parliament, I can't say any more. Like we've we've got customers in that space as well, and it has crossed my mind that you know uh, that that would well it'd destroy the business, wouldn't it? So so we we make sure it doesn't. How uh, how do you handle the latency? If a customer sitting in, uh, for example, the some area cannot accept the web, do they have a very good connection or network bandwidth? How do you handle it? So in terms of the media players, when they're in situ, what what, what do we do in latency and bad connectivity? Yeah. That's a great question, by the way, and, and thank you for asking it. Uh, so the, the media players have a cache of the data. So we, we have a, a strategy in our marketing that black screens, are, you know, we, we never want to see them. So the internal memory that, that's on board takes, a, takes a, a, a cache of the data, which we check some as well to make sure it's complete, uh, which obviously makes sense. Um, but technically, if something else was scheduled and then the internet connectivity goes wonky, or in cases where you've got large auditoriums where we can get Wi-Fi congestion, um, the, the, the boxes will just carry on looping what they're last told to do until the next instruction comes in. So, um, yeah, no, thank you for asking that question. It's a good question. So, thank you very much, Ashley. <laughs> You're going on tight. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, we're, we're going to take a little break while Tim gets set up. Um, so, grab a beer, grab whatever you're drinking.